Hey guys, how's it going? Hope everybody's doing well out there today. Uh, in this video, we're going to start a new series. Uh, I made a previous video talking about uh, the uh, Zima board here a while back and how we were going to use that to start a new series. Well, this is this is that series. So what we're gonna do is we're going to get a home server set up on the Zima board uh, 832 uh, using Open Media Vault 6. But first, a quick message from today's video sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Linode, the largest independent cloud computing provider. If you don't want to or can't for whatever reason self-host applications the way we talk about on this channel, Linode provides virtual servers that make it easy and affordable for you to host anything in the cloud. You can set up any of the applications that they have available in their marketplace with just a few clicks, or you can set up your own Docker VPS and install basically whatever you'd like in a Docker container. They have load balancers and firewalls available to help keep your apps online and safe. If you run into any trouble getting set up, Linode comes with amazing 24 seven customer support by phone or ticket, along with hundreds of guides and tutorials to help you get started. Sign up today at linode.com slash dbtech and get a $100 60 day credit on your new Linode account. Links are in the description. So as I mentioned, we are going to be using Open Media Vault 6 as well as an x86 platform. Now that's not to say that some of the containers that we're going to be using uh, later on won't be compatible uh, with Raspberry Pi or whatever. However, uh, this will be focused exclusively on x86 architecture stuff. So um, so that's just how we're gonna focus on this. We may do um, an ARM architecture system later with Open Media Vault 6, uh, but for right now, x86 all the way through this series. Also, as I mentioned, this will be using a Zima board. Now this doesn't require that you use a Zima board, just a compatible x86 platform to follow along. Uh, however, just to kind of cover our basis here, the Zima board that I'm using has uh, an Intel uh, N3450, I believe. I could be wrong. I'll put it up on the screen if I am. Anyway, it's using an Intel uh, processor. It's got eight gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of onboard EMMC storage. We're not going to be using that storage. However, uh, I've got a 256 gig NVMe drive uh, that I'm going to be using for our for our operating system, as well as a 480 gig SSD from Keoxia uh, that the folks at Zima board were nice enough to send over as well. So that's going to be our, our foundation. Of course, you can modify this to fit your needs. This is just what I'm going to be using for my setup for this series. So I'll try to put links to whatever I can in the description down below so that you can follow along uh, however you'd like to do that. So uh, with all of that said, let's jump over to my desktop and get started with the installation process of Open Media Vault 6 on our Zima board. So to get things started, of course, we'll have to download Open Media Vault. So uh, we're on their website and you can click download uh, here in the middle where it says download across the top or right in the middle of the page where it says download. Uh, once you've uh, clicked that, it will bring you to this page at least at the time of recording. Uh, we've got two options, the stable and the testing. Uh, stable is still the five series technically. However, the six series uh, is coming along very, very nicely. I've had a lot of people say that they're using six on their production setup. So that's what we're gonna try here. So, so what you'll do is you'll click the, in this case, testing button for version six. It's gonna take you over to SourceForge and start down downloading that file. I've already done that. So we're gonna skip that little part. But uh, of course, once we've got that, the first thing that we need to do is actually get the file moved over to our uh, USB drive. I'm going to be using uh, a, a USB a 16 gig a data traveler uh, G4. Uh, I picked this up on Amazon for a few bucks. It was like five bucks. So uh, that's what I'm gonna use for this. I'm gonna get it plugged in like so. And uh, here you can see that it's pff, whatever. We're not gonna deal with the autoplay. What I am gonna do though is open up Belina Etcher. Of course, you can use whatever imaging software you'd like to use. I've been using Belina for a long time and love it. So that's what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna click flash from file. I'm gonna go to this Open Media Vault uh, 6034. I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. I'm gonna select my target, which again will be this uh, Kingston Data Traveler uh, 16 gig drive. I'm gonna click select and I'll click flash. We'll give this a few minutes to do its thing. And uh, then we will uh, jump over to get this installed on our uh, new system. Okay, so it says flash complete. So that should be good to go. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just close this and then I'll come down here to make sure that this has exited uh, appropriately here. I don't see anything in there, so let's go ahead and pull this out and get it plugged in to our Zima board. Hopefully this will work. Get that plugged in. Uh, and then we're gonna come over here to Tiny Pilot. Uh, basically, this is how I'm going to interface with this so you guys can see what's going on. Um, and this part will be in the browser in the in the browser this way. The rest of it will all be uh, actually done in the browser versus what we're doing here. So what I want to do is click exit. I'm gonna send a control alt delete to this. 
so that it will reboot. And then once the screen comes up, we'll start tapping delete to get into the BIOS, the UEFI, whatever. There's our Zima board logo, so we're tapping delete here. All right, and then we're gonna go over to the boot screen. And it just isn't showing that drive. That is so, so weird. Okay, so here we are, uh, probably an hour later, uh, doing some troubleshooting, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, ultimately, the problem that I was running into uh, when I came over here, oops. When I came over here to the boot screen, uh, none of my boot options would allow me to boot from the uh, the Kingston drive, it just, it wouldn't show up. I had it plugged into a hub, ended up plugging it directly in, moving some things around. Anyway, now we're actually seeing the Kingston data traveler in here. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and let it boot this way. Uh, should be good to go. Once that's done, then we will come back in and uh, tell it to boot from um, the other drive. We should be good to go at that point. Just wanted to do a little bit of a kerfuffle there, uh, trying to get this to work. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna say quit without saving, that's fine. Uh, and then here we go. Now we're on the Open Media Vault boot screen. Uh, this is kind of like where, where it starts when it boots up. Uh, we've got some options. We can install, we can install with Serial Console, or we can go to Advanced Options. For the sake of simplicity, we're just going to do a basic install. So we'll just click on the install right there. So now, of course, we've got uh, the first thing I want to know is what language do we want to proceed with? Uh, I'm going to use English as that is the really the only language I speak. I'm here in the United States, so I'm gonna select that. Uh, for my location. The key mapping to use for your keyboard, uh, make sure you select the right one for you. Um, by default, it's uh, selected uh, American English, and that's great, that's what I wanna use. So I'll go ahead and click Enter there. And uh, then we're just going to let it kind of go through this process of figuring out what's on our system so it knows what to install and what to do and those sorts of things. Uh, so here in a moment, we should get this to pop back up. Okay, so now because I'm using this Zima board, it has two gig, one gig interfaces on it. Um, I'm pretty sure the one I want is uh, ENP2SO. Um, if not, we can change it later, but this is the one we're going to, to make an attempt with here as our primary network interface. So I'll press enter there, um, and then hopefully it will go through the process of looking for an internet connection, local or link local address, those sorts of things. Um, and then, uh, then it should be able to actually start installing uh, our software here in just a moment. Okay, so now it wants to know the host name for this system. <clears throat> um, so, so basically, what this will allow us to do is actually access our Open Media Vault uh, infrastructure, if you want to call it that, via a, well, it's called a host name. So instead of you know typing in you know 192.168.1.255 or whatever, or typing in a, a domain name or, or whatever, uh, we're actually going to be able to kind of do our own thing with this. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to call this open, or I'm going to call it um, OMV6. So that would be like the <clears throat> um, like in let, let let's use uh, dbtechreviews.com. Uh, this OMV6 would be the equivalent to DB Tech Reviews. And if we click continue or enter, now we've got the domain name. And this, this used to confuse me. Basically, this is like the .com portion of your dbtechreviews.com, just as the example there. So we can use local, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call this uh, actually LAN, because I wanna try something different here. Um, and then I'll click enter again. Of course, you can enter your own host name and, and domain name. However, make sure that you don't actually use something that might actually be used on the internet. Uh, otherwise, your system's gonna get really, really confused. So uh, that's why I chose a couple of just arbitrary omv6.lan is how we'll access this later on. So just kind of wanted to uh, do a little explainer there. So now we're gonna have a root password for this. And once you've entered that, go ahead and hit enter. Now it'll ask you to re-enter that password to make sure you didn't mess it up. And then once you've done that, you can click enter again. Then we're gonna select our time zone. I am in mountain time zone. So I'm gonna select that and press enter. So I believe the next screen is to say, hey, you've, you've got more than one, uh, one drive here. What do you wanna do? There it is. More than one storage device has been detected. Uh, so I'm gonna click continue. And it'll start the partitioner. And basically what I'm looking for here is a 256 gig drive here. Uh, however, if I notice that it's not recognizing uh, my 400 gig drive, that's fine. I can deal with that. 
later. Uh, but I do wanna make sure that I install this on uh, this SDA drive. That's the 256 gig. Well, it's in a Sabre enclosure. Uh, I don't remember the manufacturer of the drive, but it is that 256 gig Sabre option there. So I'll click enter. And then it's like, hey, are you sure this is what you wanna do? It's kind of your, your last stop. Are you sure you wanna write these changes to the disk? So I'm gonna say yes. And then it'll go through the process of copying everything over and getting ready for the actual install. It'll do the install, uh, and then it will tell us that we can uh, safely reboot our system. Okay, so now it wants to uh, configure the package manager uh, so that it can do updates and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm gonna select United States because again, that's where I'm located. So I'll press enter. Uh, then you've got options as far as which of the uh, Debian servers you'd like to use, whether it's uh, the, the default or uh, any of the other hosted options. I'm just gonna use the, the default for the uh, archive mirror. Uh, I'm not gonna use any proxies, but if you need to use a proxy, you can absolutely put that in there uh, as it is, and I'll press enter. So now it's going through the process of installing the Grub bootloader. Uh, once that's done, we'll move on to it. Of course, additional steps here as necessary, but I think we're actually pretty close to this being complete here. So we'll go ahead and let this finish up and come back. Okay, so now it's saying, hey, before we go, um, would you like to set your, or is asking, is the system clock set to UTC? Uh, it, mine isn't, I actually just saw it a minute ago. Uh, it's within 30 seconds of, of actual local time. So I'm gonna say no, my system is not set to UTC um, because, well, because it's not. So I'll click no. A few moments later. Okay, so here we are. Uh, it says the, uh, the it says finish the installation, installation complete. Uh, it's time to boot into your system. Make sure to remove the installation media. So the USB drive that I was fighting with earlier. And then um, and that way you can boot into your new system rather than starting the installation. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on continue. I'm gonna give this a second and then I'll go ahead and pull uh, the USB drive out. Okay, so here we are on our desktop. This is a brand new install of OpenMedia Vault 6. And uh, the first thing we wanna do is get logged in. The default username and password will be admin for the username. And then the password will be OpenMedia Vault, all lowercase, all one word, no spaces or anything like that. Press enter and uh, then we're brought to this page and there's really not a whole lot going on here. Now, from my past experience, uh, we can set this up by going to the settings page and choosing any of the widgets here that we would like to see. However, I have noticed that um, for some reason, sometimes this dashboard information disappears. Uh, like we'll click save here. And then here we are, we are, we're good. We've got all of this stuff up and running. Uh, however, on a reboot or something like that. For some reason, this sometimes goes away. Uh, hopefully they will get that fixed, but just know that that is something that may happen. So uh, really, I think what the first thing that we wanna do here is, is make sure that we have all of our drives attached. So what we're gonna do is come over here to storage and we'll go to disks and let's just take a look and see what disks we have available. So on here, we have a 32 gig uh, EMMC device that's on board. We've also got a 400 and, uh, well, this has 447 gig. It's a 480 gig SSD um, that is not from Sabrent. It is uh, it is actually from Keoxia. The folks over at Zima board uh, sent over this SSD for me to use. Uh, and of course, I've also got um, a, a USB drive for the operating system. We're gonna use uh, this D or SDA drive as our media, our, our file storage drive. And then we'll use obviously SDB as our um, operating system, that's where it's currently installed. So that's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna use, uh, at least I'm not going to use this uh, 32 gig EMMC uh, device. It just doesn't make sense for what I'm doing here. So what I do wanna do though, is actually come over here to file systems. Um, and there are no file systems attached right now. So I'm gonna create, click on create slash mount. I'm going to mount a drive. And then what I wanna do is actually select this, uh, this 447.12 Gibby Byte uh, device here. Uh, if your device uh, isn't formatted or isn't formatted in uh, a compatible file system, you will need to uh, create a file system, format the drive, and then you should be able to mount it. Um, there is a threshold warning here. Basically, when it gets to whatever percentage you have dictated here, you'll get a notification letting you know that that drive is almost full. I'm gonna leave it at 85. That's probably fine for what I'm gonna do here. Uh, for the comment, uh, I'm just gonna call this files. I could call it Docker, I could call it containers, I could call it whatever. I'm just gonna call it files, and then I'm gonna click save. <clears throat> 
Do you really want to mount this file system? Yes, I do. Thank you very much for asking. We're going to give this just a second here um, and uh, just make sure that uh, this yellow bar comes up and it did. So what I want to do is actually click apply, uh, just letting it know that yes, I really, really, really do want to do uh, this thing of mounting this hard drive. So we're going to give this a second to do its thing. Um, and then once we come back, uh, it should, uh, this page should update with some new information saying that it's mounted uh, and whatnot. So we've got our drive uh, up and running here uh, as a mounted file system using ext4 as that file system. Our available storage is 434 gigs. Uh, we're using 56 kilobytes um, and we are mounted. We are not referenced, but we are online. Um, so the next thing I think we want to do here is actually add a couple of shared folders. Uh, I like to do this uh, early on just so I don't have to worry about it later. Uh, basically, I want to think about what file or what, what folders I'm going to need for my setup. Uh, I'm going to have uh, mostly Docker containers on here. Um, and in those Docker containers that we will we will end up installing later, uh, we're going to have uh, some containers that are just going to need a place to mount their configuration. Um, and maybe that's all that container will need is just a place to mount the configuration. Uh, other containers will need a, a place to mount uh, stored files, uh, shared files, things like that. So what I want to do is actually create two different shared folders. I want one for configs and I want one for data. Uh, that's just how I like to do things. Uh, you may want to experiment with that and come up with a solution that works for you, but config and data are the two folders that I'm going to set up here. So what I'm going to do is come over here to shared folders and I'm going to click the plus sign here. Uh, the first one I'm going to do is configs like so. Uh, the file system will be the only file system that's on here. That's the SDA one. Uh, that's the one that we just created. Um, for uh, the relative path, it's going to insert that automatically. Uh, next, we've got um, basically which permissions do we want uh, to be able to, to have for this. Uh, the default setting here is just fine, in my opinion. Uh, if you've got um, uh, something that needs to be a bit more secure, maybe you're going to have lots of people accessing uh, different things on your server. You may want to crank the, the settings down as far as permissions are concerned to be more secure. Uh, but for, for a basic setup with maybe one or two users who are at least fairly competent with doing this, uh, the default settings should be just fine. Also, uh, we're not going to make this folder uh, publicly available on the network, and we'll, we'll cover uh, making those, those shares available, but for right now, um, we're not gonna make that publicly available, so it shouldn't be a big deal anyway. Um, you can leave a comment down here if you'd like. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just come down here and click on Save. So now we have this configs uh, located on SDA1. We've got a relative path, we've got an absolute path. We've got a yellow bar that just popped up. We're not gonna click that yet, though. Uh, we're gonna click that here in a minute after we do another one of these. <clears throat> Um, so what I want to do next is I'm going to click, uh, again, the plus sign. I'm going to call this data. Again, we're going to use the same file system. Uh, again, your, your, um, Permissions here are kind of up to you on how you'd like to do this. Um, because some of this will be shared data um, that, that, that we may want publicly available on the network, uh, I'm actually gonna set this one to everybody can read and write. Again, if you've got other users on your system that you don't necessarily trust, you may wanna tighten down these permissions based on your use case. But uh, because I expect this data to be publicly available on my network, uh, I'm going to let everybody read and write to, these, to this particular folder. Um, and then again, the comment, uh, you can you can put something there in there if you'd like, I'm not going to. Uh, and once we've got that, we can go ahead and click on save. And here we've got both our data and our config folders uh, that are available. Um, and one of the things that I do, that I really do like about what they've done on Open Media Vault 6 versus 5, um, in order to get this absolute path, uh, you used to have to um, modify the, the header up here uh, up here next to like absolute path or relative path. There used to be a, a, a selection box where you would select uh, which columns you wanted to see. I like that absolute path is now here by default. Also, in order to get these paths, it used to be you'd have to right click, go to inspect, um, and then find uh, where the, the mapping or the matching data is over here uh, in, in all of this HTML and do that. Uh, they were actually nice enough. I actually think that might've been my fault to put a copy option right there. Uh, we used to do a lot of the right clicking, inspecting elements and that kind of stuff in the Open Media Vault five days. And I'm glad to see that that has changed in Open Media Vault six. Um, <clears throat> again, you, you can continue to add as many uh, folders as you need to, whether they're shared or not shared on your network. Uh, but these are the two that we're going to start with. This may change later, um, but that's where we're gonna start for right now. Um, the other thing that we want to do here, uh, now that now that we've got our, our two shared folders, our two, yeah, shared folders, there we go. I'm going to click apply 
and then I'm going to say yes, yes, I really do. I want to make those two shared folders available uh, to the system. Uh, we'll give this just a second, and then we're actually going to make the uh, the data folder uh, available on the network. And the, how we're going to do that uh, is actually coming over here to services. We're going to come over here to SMB CIFS, uh, and we're going to add a share to this. Let's look at settings real quick. Actually, I'm glad we did because we want to enable SMB CIFS to make this available to uh, Windows clients, other, other Windows devices on the network. Uh, we are, so we're going to scroll down and we're going to click save. And then we can go to shares uh, and we can add our shares. Oops, maybe. Oh, nope, it's not going to let me do that until I click. Yeah. All right, so let's click the little apply button up here. Click confirm. Oops, click confirm. There we go. And click yes. And then once this has saved the settings to the system, then we should be able to go in, in and make that uh, that data folder available on the network. Okay, so now that we've got that done, we'll go over here to shares and then we'll click the plus sign. Oh, nah, there we go. Let's select a shared folder. Uh, again, we're not gonna do configs. We don't want that to be publicly uh, manageable on the network. Uh, just. Just for security reasons, we're not gonna make that available. What we are gonna do though, is make this data folder available. Um, do we wanna make this public? Uh, I'm gonna say uh, yes. Um, we're gonna say guests only. That way we don't have to put in a username and password in order to access the data in these folders. Uh, if you wanted to, you could say guests are allowed and then add uh, users to this share. But again, I think that's, that's a bit too much for what we're gonna do here. Um, you could set this to read only. I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, otherwise your containers later won't be able to use that. Uh, you could enable the recycle bin in case you accidentally delete something and would like to the ability to restore that item. So let's go ahead and check that. Um, and then, um, you know, let's not hide uh, dot files. Sometimes we will get a .env file or something that we will need access to and uh, hiding the dot files by default just complicates that. So uh, I think basically all of that said and done, we can go ahead over here and click on save. And then we should get uh, an option up here to click uh, the, the apply button again. And then of course we want to confirm that. Okay, so now we have our data share available. So let's actually click down here on uh, our folder. Uh, let's do a double backslash and then 192.168.68.56. Oops, I fat fingered that, didn't I? There we go. Now we have a data folder and now we can uh, do what we wanna do in this data folder. Uh, so that is set up and ready to go. Now we've got access to that folder. Uh, however, we don't have access to the, the, the config folder, which for security purposes is just fine for this setup. I think the other thing that we wanna do now that we have that set up um, is actually add our OMV extras uh, so that we can have things like Docker and Fortiner and Yacht if we wanna use Yacht. Uh, so let's, let's go over here. Let's go to omvextras.org uh, like so. And then um, we're gonna use this command right here. We're gonna copy this. We're gonna to go to our terminal. Uh, you can use basically any terminal you'd like to use. And I'm gonna do SSH space root at uh, 192.168.68.56, I believe. Let me verify that. 68.56, holy cow, there we go. So I'm gonna press enter. Oh, okay. So uh, this is because I was doing testing earlier. If you ever run into a situation like this, uh, basically this is Windows saying, hey, um, this isn't the same machine with the same IP address that you connected to last time. So I'm not gonna let you connect until you acknowledge that. So the way we're going to acknowledge that is come over here uh, to our, our folders. I'm gonna go into the C drive. I'm gonna go to users. I'm gonna go to my user. I'm gonna go into SSH. And then right here where it says known hosts, I'm gonna right click that and I'm going to click on open with and I'll select uh, WordPad, should be just fine for this. And then right here is the entry that I'm looking for. That's 192.168.6856. And I'm just gonna delete that and click save or control S to save. Uh, then I can close this folder and I'll come back over here. I'll press up to, to bring up the last command and press enter. And I was like, hey, you've never connected to this service, to this device, would you like to? And I'm gonna type in yes, yes I would. And I click enter, I'm gonna enter my root password, press enter, and then here we go. Uh, there's nothing in our home directory, that's good. Uh, so let's do a control L to clear our screen and then control V to paste in this command. Basically this is saying, hey, use wget to grab uh, the the uh, the file that's located at github.com slash open media vault plugin developers packages raw master install. Once you've grabbed that file, I'd like you to execute it with the bash command. Uh, that's what this command right here is saying. So I'm gonna go ahead and press enter on my keyboard. 
And so it's gonna, like I said, it downloaded all of that stuff. It's executing the command, which will now download some more stuff and install all of the stuff that we need for Open Media Vault extras, which again will give us Docker and Portainer and a few other things that, uh, available on our system. So once this is done, we'll come back and take a look. Okay, so now we have uh, Open Media Vault extras installed via command line. So what I'm gonna do is just right click, or sorry, <laughs> refresh this page and now we've got Open Media Vault extras right down here. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna click on that. Uh, of course, the first thing I want to do here is install Docker. Uh, you can change where you'd like your Docker uh, storage to be located. Uh, I think right where it is is just fine. Um, so basically what we're going to do is just come down here and click on install. Um, and then uh, I hate this, but this is how it is. Uh, this close button doesn't work um, and, and, and until it's done. And you'll only know that this is done when the close button is enabled. Um, I really wish that this was I wish there was more of a notification uh, that let us know that it was done, but we just have to look at this button and when it when it becomes active, then we know we're, we're good to go. Okay, well, okay, okay. So it, it actually says end of line now. I've never seen that. I, I'm, thank you to whoever put that in. That's super helpful. Uh, but now, of course, we can also see that the button, uh, the close button is uh, available, so I can click on that. And if I click on Docker again, uh, here we can see that uh, it is installed and running. So we're good to go there. Uh, I'm gonna click on Portainer over here on the left. Um, and basically it says no uh, Portainer container was found. Our web port uh, and our agent port were 9,000 and 8,000 respectively. Um, you can use Enterprise Edition if you want. However, uh, that does require a license from Portainer in order to use that. So that's up to you. Um, and then you can, if you want to choose SSL TLS, uh, I'm not going to. What I'm gonna do is come over here and click on Install. And then again, the same thing, this will go through its install process and then this button will become available once it's done. We'll see if end of line is also available here uh, when it's done to let us know more than just this button down here. So let's give it a second and see what happens. Okay, they added end of line to that. Again, whoever whoever did that, thank you. Uh, that's, it's the simplest things that really make this a better user experience. So uh, stoked to see that. Uh, so I'm gonna click close. And uh, then again, if I come up here and click on Portainer, uh, here we can see that it's been up for 17 seconds. Again, our web port's on 9,000. So let's click on Open Web. And here we go. Uh, so let's let's get this just set up real quick. Uh, I'm gonna type in a different username than uh, admin. Try not to use admin for this. It's just, it's just giving them the keys. Whoever maybe uh, tried to access your system, using the default username is just taking away one of the steps to hacking your system. Use a different username. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I've entered my password. Uh, you can decide whether or not you want the anonymous collection of statistics available from your system. Completely up to you. But now I'm gonna click on create user. And then I'm gonna click here to get rid of that. So basically what I'm gonna do is just click on get started. And, I, and then if I click here, of course, we've just got the one container, the one image, the one volume, and it's all portainer. So the one other thing that I really wanna do here to get this set up so that I don't forget to do it later is come over here to environments uh, like so and click on local. And then for our public IP, I actually just wanna enter the server's IP address. So I can click 192.168.68.56, like so, and then click on update environment. Um, if you're not familiar with Portainer, uh, what that does is, is, well, I'll show you. If we come over here to containers and right over here, we've got a published ports of 9,000 and 8,000. Um, if I click this, uh, it should just open up a new window and there we go. If we hadn't updated the environmental uh, setting over there and we clicked this, it would have taken us to 0.0.0.0 port 9,000 and that, that doesn't do anything for us. So we just set up that port or that, that IP address to make sure that we can click on these public ports later uh, and access our containers even easier than before. Um, so that's that's really all I wanna do in Portainer right now. It is up, it is running. Uh, it has been it has been modified so that we don't have to deal with it later. So let's, uh, let's get out of Portainer here. And let's close uh, this tab over here. Uh, let's let let's take a look at a couple of other things just real quick. Uh, for our workbench, um, port 80 uh, is what we are currently on for Open Media Vault's dashboard. Um, we're going to want to change that to something else um, because we're going to end up using a reverse proxy at some point uh, once we've got a few different things set up on here and. Uh, the reverse proxy will need port 80, also port 443, um, but we need that we need port 80 for the reverse proxy to work. So I'm gonna change this to port 89. Uh, again, you can choose basically whatever port you want, but uh, if you're uh, if you're already familiar with the, the containers that you're going to be setting up later, uh, kind of think about what those 
ports or what those container port ports might be and try not to use any of those. I know that seems out of scope, but anyway, I'm just gonna put this on port 89. Uh, my auto logout time, uh, often I set it to never. I'm gonna set it to, which is up here at the top or disabled. Uh, I'm actually gonna set this to 60 minutes. That should be fine. Um, and then I'm going to click save over here. Um, and then we should get a yellow bar up here again at the top. There it is, so I'll click that and I'll say yes, yes, I'm sure and click okay. Okay, so this actually means, this is this is a good thing, believe it or not. Uh, what we wanna do is delete all of this at the end and change that to port 89 by just adding a colon and then 89 and clicking enter. Uh, and here we go. So again, admin and open media vault. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna change here uh, see, and here here we go. Uh, our, that, the dashboard that we set up earlier with all of the little pretty widgets, gone. This is what I was talking about. So just know that that is something that, that will probably happen. Um, the other thing that I wanna do is actually come over to network uh, and go to general. And uh, nope, I lied. I think it's under interfaces. There we go. Uh, I'm gonna click, I'm gonna click our interface. I'm gonna click edit. Um, and then DHCP, uh, let's switch this to static. And now at this point, you can enter the IP address that's up in your browser bar, uh, not the port, just the IP address. So we're gonna say 192.168.68.56. Uh, uh, with this setup, uh, your net mask should be 255.255.255.0. And your gateway will be, in, in my case anyway, the 192.168.68.1. Uh, basically, that is the, the IP address of the router um, that, that gives us our gateway to our to, our, to the internet. <clears throat> I could talk, man. Okay, so uh, we're not gonna do anything with IPv6. Uh, what I do wanna do though is change the DNS servers. Um, so what I wanna do is just change this to 1.1.1.1 uh, just to avoid any complications later. Um, this is what I always set my, my, my DNS settings on my Open Mini Vault to. Uh, you could use Quad9, you could use Google. I like to use Cloudflare. Make your, you, you can, again, pick whatever you want there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just leave everything else the same and click save. And again, we'll probably get, um, yep, we're gonna get this up here. So we'll click on save and click on yes. Okay, so now that is saved, we're good to go. Uh, I'm not actually sure why it doesn't show DNS here, but it doesn't, so there you go. Um, and let's see, I think, I mean, I just, I wanna run, there's a firewall option here that we can actually set up a firewall for access uh, to our system here if we wanna do that. Uh, let's look at services, FTP services available, uh, uh, NFS, rsync, we looked at SMBC IFS, uh, SSH uh, should be enabled. It is enabled. Uh, for security reasons, you should probably change your uh, your SSH port to something other than 22. Um, uh, I'm gonna change it to 2234. Um, and, and then I'm gonna click save. And again, uh, up here at the top, we'll probably get a yellow bar to click apply. Yep, there it is. So go ahead and click on that and then click confirm and then click yes. Uh, and that way port 22 isn't our default port for SSH. It's not a huge difference, but I think it's enough to be safe. Okay, so I think that is a good enough place to stop for right now. Uh, we, we got Open Media Vault 6 installed uh, and set up. We got it configured with Docker and Portainer. Uh, we set up our SSH, we set up a couple of shares and made one of those shares available on the network. So we've got a good foundation to move forward with, with future videos on getting things set up with our home server. So at this point, I'd actually like to ask you guys, is there anything additional in Open Media Vault 6 that you'd like to see me cover like directly here in the dashboard, whether it's plugins or settings or, or whatever. Also, let me know uh, what kind of uh, containers you'd like to see installed in Docker. I think I'd like to go for kind of a, a productivity build. So, um, so maybe, you know, some, some task management, um, some file management, some file sharing, uh, just, just some productivity stuff in general. Of course, if you've got other ideas, definitely let me know. Uh, of course, I also consider uh, media, whether it's movies or TV shows or music, to be productivity because I'm somebody who likes to have stuff running in the background to keep my brain kind of occupied doing other things while I'm doing the task at hand. Uh, so let me know what kind of containers you'd like to see installed in here. Uh, of course, like I said, any kind of the additional plugins or settings in Open Media Vault 6, let me know what your thoughts are as far as what you might want to see in addition to this. Um, and I think with all of that said, I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. So as always, thanks for your time. I always appreciate your support. And I'll talk to you in the next video.